continue our intro to see. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the fourth day of the test stream here where we're doing a little introduction to C. Yesterday, uh, we got to do some fun stuff. We sort of started to really see how the, the code and the memory actually works together. And we sort of did some, some, we played around a little bit, sort of showing where things are stored in the computer. We, we did a bunch of things that I'd kind of been, you know, hoping to get to. Uh, in the first two streams, I was kind of like building up to them. And, and, and last night's stream was, was pretty good. That way I got to tie a lot of things together. So I was pretty excited. There was one snafu in the stream and I will correct it now. Uh, if you're there for the Q and A, then you already know what it is I'm talking about. But what I tried to do yesterday, uh, I wanted to show you because the, you know, on, I believe it was Thursday night, no, sorry. Uh, yeah, Thursday night stream, we started to look at the disassembly. So we had written some C code and we were looking at the disassembly and I was showing you some stuff. And I said, well, this, these numbers over here on the side, you know, those numbers basically correspond to addresses in memory of where your code actually is because the processor obviously has to read the code um, to execute it. It's got to read the stuff that we write. And so it's just memory like everything else. Code is memory just like data is in memory. Everything's in memory. Everything you ever do is going to be in memory somewhere. And so I was like, you know, this was the address of where this particular piece of code is uh, in the actual memory of the computer when the CPU is going to go fetch it, execute it. And I was like, I want to show that. So what I did is I had showed uh, earlier in, in the stream, I had showed, you know, you go over here to the memory window, you can open up this memory window. And if you're trying to look at something, you can cut and paste an address in there, which I did. And I showed you like, here's the memory, right? Like we could see the memory, we played with it, it was great. It all worked great. And then I was like, well, you can grab, you know, an, the, the address here and look at your code. And when I did it, it was like unable to evaluate expression. Now I didn't really know what was going on there because you should be able to look at the code, but I assumed that maybe it was something that had changed recently in Windows since like the last time I'd you know done anything like that. Because it's not something you do that often, look at the code, the actual code segments and stuff. Um, so I just assumed, well, maybe for security purposes, they turned off reading, because uh, uh, any given page in memory, any virtual page in memory can be marked as readable, executable, writable, these sorts of things. Um, so I was pretty sure, I mean, I was like, well, yeah, I don't know what's going on here. Maybe they marked it so that you can't read those pages to avoid some kind of hack storing attempt. I don't know. But point being, I was, I was kind of confused by this. I didn't know what was going on. And it turns out that it was just me not remembering, um, or maybe they changed it, but I'm assuming it's just me not remembering, that when you put a hexadecimal address, which is what this is in here, you have to prefix it with 0x just like you would in code. It's like a little notation that says the thing that's coming next is hexadecimal, which doesn't really make much sense when you look at it this way because it's like, okay, if it's got Ds in it, it's obviously not decimal, it must be hexadecimal. But if you had a number that just was hexadecimal, didn't happen to use any of the letters, you could see it maybe wouldn't know which one you meant. So putting the OX in actually does let you look at the code. And thankfully someone caught that and, and mentioned it on the Q&A. So we were able to do it in the Q&A, but I just wanted to correct that for anyone who doesn't watch the Q&As. That was what had happened. So it's actually totally fine. And those pages are not marked uh, unreadable or anything like that. And you know, it makes sense anyway. It was, it was really, the re one of the reasons it was so confusing to me is because we're looking at it here. I mean, the debugger obviously can access that code page because you know, if it couldn't, then how is it showing us the disassembly? How is it showing us what the code is here if it couldn't inspect it? So when I asked the debugger to inspect it in here, it shouldn't be like able to inspect it in one window and not able to inspect it in the other. But you know, I've learned not to assume stuff like that because when you're programming on a giant complicated operating system with a giant complicated IDE, you never know what could be happening, right? I mean, you never know what might be going on internally. It could be that the person who implemented the thing that disassembles here was using a different way of getting at the pages. And so it worked. And then the person who wrote the memory window didn't. So I didn't want to jump to conclusions. And also during a live stream, I mean, I'll be honest, when you're live streaming, your brain is thinking a lot about how to explain stuff and it's not thinking as well about how to troubleshoot stuff. So it really does help to have people in the stream watching out for me. And I really appreciate that because your brains are focused on what I'm doing and my brain's focusing on explaining. So having the two is actually pretty good. It's kind of like pair programming and someone can be like, no, 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 you just forgot the blah. And it's like, very good. So I really appreciate that, whoever that was. Thank you very much. I know it was uh, Matthew Vandevender who who actually posted it at the end of the chat, but I think he said that it was someone else who had said it earlier, like at the time. Uh, I don't read the chat during the stuff because it'd be too distracting for me, but I, I read it at the end. So anyway, that's just the one thing that I wanted to correct. And it's not that big of a deal. You will rarely be doing that with code, but I just wanted to show you 
uh, that it is there because, again, one of the, the main things that I could keep harping on through this entire series is just always saying everything's in memory, everything is just talking about how to get things into the CPU, do stuff on them, put them back out to memory, that's the whole thing. And so I just want to show that even the code is there. And basically all code is, is it's a bunch of encodings for these instructions. And I think there's a thing show code bytes, yeah. So show code bytes um, actually puts, right after the address, it actually puts you what the encoding actually was. So this uh, mnemonic and this uh, you know, operand and this operand are actually encoded this way. This is how Intel encodes, uh, how the x86 encode, uh, sorry, this is, uh, no, this is x86, we're compiling a 32-bit mode. So how the x86 processor expects to read things that will read them like this and know that this is what you want it to do. And the disassembler, the thing that's showing us the actual assembly language here, is basically just reading these code bytes in you know, Visual Studio is reading these code bytes and then disassembling them and going, oh, okay, that's the mnemonic for move. That's like, that means a move instruction. So I'm gonna write move so it's easier for you to read. So you don't have to sit around going, oh, what is 6F445FB? F I mean, because I have no idea what that is. You'd have to go look at instruction tables to know what they are. And if you're a hardcore assembly language programmer, you probably know what some of them translate to, but I'm so not that guy. So I, ne I need the translation. Anyway, uh, so, one of the interesting things here, and this is just an aside, uh, because hey, it's a weekend stream, we could be a little more meandering. One thing that's kind of interesting here, a little aside, is that there's different types of processors. Uh, I mean, I guess I should say, there's different types of philosophies in processor architecture. And like I made abundantly clear on last week's stream, I am not a hardware guy, so I'm not the person to explain them to you. But what I will say, just in passing, is that there's different kinds. Some kinds of processors, the philosophy is the instructions are a fixed size. So like the number of bytes it takes to encode any given instruction is fixed. So if you have an instruction like, you know, move this to here or whatever, or add this to this or whatever, like we've got, those would all be the same size. It doesn't matter what the instruction is. They're always the same size. And that, you know, that would be like, uh, I, I believe on, um, for example, PowerPC, that was true. So like, you know, on a PowerPC, every instruction in memory as it's encoded, when it, you know, when the CPU is reading it out of memory, those instructions are the same size. But on Intel CPUs, uh, that they don't uh, use that philosophy. They have instructions that are variable length. So basically, as the instruction is being decoded, it looks at what the actual instruction is and what the actual uh, code, you know, code bytes are to figure out how many it should read. So it kind of dynamically unpacks it. And you can actually see that going on here, right? You can see um, if we were to take this line, for example, which is uh, one of those move instructions, it's moving the value FF uh, into, uh, which again is 255. That's the hexadecimal, which actually I'm gonna cover hexadecimal today for the first time, even though it's kind of keeps poking out at us. Um, so it's gonna move that 255, it's gonna move it to uh, this location, the test, test location, whatever the address is um, of test, it's gonna do that move. That is encoded as four bytes here, C6, 4, 5, FB, FF, right? Um, and hexadecimal, uh, again, which we'll cover in a little bit, it's each letter is basically four bits. So if you see two uh, hexadecimal uh, letters or numbers, you know that you're looking at eight bits. So this is 32 bits right here, right? This is eight, 16, uh, uh, 24, 32. But if we go down and look at this add instruction, where we're just adding one to the register EAX, we're taking whatever's in that register and we're adding one, that is encoded as only three. Uh, so it's encoded as 83C001, and there isn't a fourth, you know, a fourth byte there. The fourth byte is actually, you know, just used for the next instruction. So it's only three bytes per instruction for these guys. And I am certainly not knowledgeable enough about hardware to tell you which one of those is the right methodology or what the trade-offs are between them. Um, I just wanted to point out that that is the case. And so it's interesting to kind of think about a little bit that there's so much of a difference there. This can get pretty extreme because as you can see down here, this guy only has one, one uh, byte of code. Push EDX, which is a, a stack push kind of thing. You know, we were talking about the stack and I was saying the stack grows. This grows the stack. Um, one code byte. Anyway, so I won't, uh, that's not really super relevant to us and it's not something that's gonna come up in the series, uh, I don't think at all, uh, but it's worth kind of noting the differences between CPUs there and that there's different kind of architectures and different sorts of things happen in them. Because as you go, um, if you start to care more as you code about 
what the processor is and how it works and you know or even if it's just fascinating to you a lot of things are just of interest to me i like learning about them even though i'm not an expert and don't actually need necessarily some of that knowledge it's just fun to learn about these sort of things like why i was talking about learning about the adding circuit it's fun to know how people make a cpu add numbers together or something right because it's, you know, it's what we use every day and it's kind of interesting to learn a little bit about the other disciplines that are involved in making a game run uh, that have nothing to do with maybe what we do day to day. So, uh, today what I'd like to do, since we kind of got to the point where we were actually thinking about memory and code and that sort of stuff, is I want to actually go over um, some, uh, I wrote, I actually even had some notes here. I want to go over sort of looking at memory in a little more detail in terms of what C, how we actually program in C to use memory uh, effectively. And so the first thing I wanted to talk about uh, was basically like casting and endianness. I wanted to start talking about how these values actually work. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna, we're gonna get rid of the code that we were writing. We're gonna start a little fresh here. Um, just gonna check, make sure we have a clean compile and we do. So what I'm going to do now is I am going to go back to what we did originally. I'm going to make a unsigned, uh, I'm going to make an unsigned 8-bit value as I, my cord gets caught here. All right. I'm going to make an unsigned 8-bit value uh, that we are going to start looking at. And I think I'll stick with calling it test. Um, and I am going to assign a value to it. I'm going to assign the value, uh, let's say 500. No, that's not going to work, 200. Uh, and since, of course, it's only 8 bits, I can't represent 500. Off to a good start today. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run to that line, um, and then we are going to execute that line, and we should see our value getting set to 200. And it is exactly what we expected. Now, if you remember from last time, the ampersand, if I want to, I can always put an ampersand in front of something to ask where in memory that thing is. It's taking the address uh, of that variable. And so this tells me exactly where it is. And now we remember we can go to our memory window, um, which I, th I guess at this point, since I'm talking about memory so much, maybe we should even dock, maybe we should even dock that. So one of the things that you can do in Visual Studio is you can kind of drag these things around. And there's this little flower pattern thing. If you use the little arrows that are on the flower pattern, um, I don't know if you can see that on the stream because it may not be something that is captured, but it comes up with a little flower pattern and there's arrows pointing up, down, left, and right. If you pick one, it'll dock like above to the left to the right of or whatever. But I'm just going to pick the middle thing that doesn't have an arrow on it, which docks it right in place. Um, and so now I've got a memory window that's just kind of sitting down here. And that should be fine, I think, for our purposes. And I'll move it up a little bit so that it's not obscured too much by the, uh, uh, by the, the video of me talking to you. So if I go here now and I, I look at this address that we've got for, uh, at, you know, for, for test, the actual address of the variable, uh, that address is ox23f917. And here we are uh, looking at the actual values. And I'm going to switch out of hexadecimal display again because I don't want to talk about that quite yet, although we will actually talk about it today. So I am going to uh, go to, why is it, you know, it, it always likes to slide me around. I wish it would just kind of leave that there. There we go. Okay. So here we are. And here is our 200. We've actually, you know, done the assignment already. And what I'd like to point out to you is that we are looking at these values as individual bytes. So each one of these values that you see in the memory window corresponds to eight bits of the memory in the computer. So what we're going to start to address now is what happens if we ask for more than eight bits, right? What happens if instead of saying unsigned car, right? What happens if I were to say unsigned short? Now remember an unsigned short is 16 bits. Um, so care is 8, short is 16. So now I could do the 500 that I typed in originally, but that will take more than 8 bits to represent. And we've asked for 16 bits, so it shouldn't be a problem, but the question is, since we were looking at memory there, where does it actually go, right? Where does it actually go when I, when I write that 500? Well, so again, let's take a look, um, and I'll cut, you know, get this value out here. We'll look at the memory, 33 FBE4. And we're going to go ahead and write into this location uh, 500. So let's see what happens. Step. Now, did you see those two change? It was these, right? So what actually happened was here is the byte that was actually being pointed to, right? Here is the location. It wrote to that byte, it wrote 244, and then it wrote to one byte after it, okay? And what I'd like you to notice about these two 
is that if we actually break down the binary as to what these two things represent, you know that the 244 isn't the higher part of the binary, isn't the higher part of the 16 bits. Because what are the 16 bits for 500, right? The 16 bits for 500 are this, right? You've got, well, you know, and I could even make a little, I'm gonna make a cute little diagram here. You're gonna love, you're gonna love my ASCII art skills. They're gonna be awesome, right? So I'm gonna make a thing that shows you 16 bits here, right? Um, these are actually the bits. So these are not hexadecimal values. These can either be ones or zeros, right? And so what we wanna do is we want to represent 500. So our highest bit that we want to do is going to be 256, right? Which is this value here, that equals 256. Because remember, these are powers of two. I don't expect you to know these in your head, but it goes right one, two, four, eight. This guy right here is 16. I don't know how I'm gonna do that. Look at me go, ladies and gentlemen. Can you believe it? 32, 64, right? 128. 256. And then they'll keep going up 512 and whatever. We don't actually need those to represent 500 because since we know the next bit here, this bit would be 512, right? Read these vertically, by the way. 512, 512, 256, 128. I know it's a little hard to read. Uh, since this bit would be 512 and that's higher than the number, we know that the first bit that we have to set is 256, right? So if we subtract 500 from 256, and in fact, we can even use calc to do this. I don't pretend to be a, 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 a math whiz. Um, so if we have 500 and we subtract 256, we're left with 244, right? Uh, and so if we, if we wanna do 244, we can go ahead and set 128 as well, right? And then we'll subtract 128 from it. So now we've added, five, we've added 256 and 128. We're left with 116, which is still higher than 64. So we can set that, right? So we'll set that, there, 64. We're down to 52, 52 still higher than 32, so we got to subtract 32 from it as well. Down to 20, 16 still there, minus 16. We're down to four, that one, minus four is zero. So we have successfully created our number in binary by hand. You add four to 16 to 32 to 64 to 128 to 256 and you will get 500. Very exciting, right? So. If we actually look at these two parts, right, I said that we were seeing it in bytes over here. So our byte part is gonna be the first eight bits, which is this, right? One, 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 zero, one, zero, zero. Yeah, it kinda sounds like a Flight of the Concord song. Uh, but the part up here is actually just one. We only used in, in our second byte that we asked for, the, the high order byte is what we would call that typically because there's like, it, it's high and low based on um, basically how much power it sort of has. If you want to add uh, a very high number, you're gonna add something in the high order byte because they all correspond to things that are all higher powers of two than the lower order byte, if you will. So if we take a look at this, right, uh, the only thing that we had in the high order byte is just one, just the one bit was set. But in this one, we actually had the four bit, the 16 bit, the 32 bit, the 64 bit, and the 128 bit, right? Oops, we don't need to do that at all. Uh, so if I go back to my calc here and I see what that's actually gonna be, right? It's going to be four plus 16 plus 32 plus 64 plus 128, and that's 244, which is exactly what we got here. So our low byte is 244, our high byte is one, which is exactly what we expected. But now what I want you to think about is why they are in that order right? We have an address in memory. These count up sequentially. This right here is the 3,406,820th byte in memory, in our virtual memory space. And then this one will be the one, one, more, one after that. It goes sequentially, right? So this will be one higher. Uh, that one will be the 3,406,821st byte in memory. 22nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, so going, on, going on and on and on. But when you think about it, since we have these bytes in memory, it's totally arbitrary how the CPU chooses to interpret them. It didn't have to put the low order byte first and then the higher order byte. It could have chosen to do them in the opposite order. There's no reason, it's just convention, right? The CPU is going to have a circuit in it that knows how to add together things that are 16 bits long, but where it got each part of the 16 bits is irrelevant. It doesn't matter, right? There isn't some hard law of physics that says that you must store the low part first and the high part second. So what this is called, it is actually an arbitrary choice on the, on the part of the CPU designer way back when the person first designed the x86. 
What this is called is called this is called endianness. Um, and honestly, um, I don't know if it's one n or two. You know, spelling also not my strong suit. So we're just gonna say endian for now, and adding this to the end will be an exercise less for Google. These are called little endian mode and big endian mode. Uh, and I believe they come, I want to say it comes from like Gulliver's Travels. It comes from like a crazy fiction book reference that happened a long time before like I was born. I don't even know. Uh, but point being, the convention in computing is to use the term little endian if the low order byte comes first in memory. And big endian if the high order comes first in memory. So what we are, right, if, since we put our 254 first and our one second, that was low and then high, we are little endian because the little part comes first. And in fact, uh, x86 processors, the standard mode used for ARM processors, although ARMs, I believe the architecture is actually switchable, so it, but the standard kind that you would see in like an Android or an iOS device, ARM processors are uh, x64, the 64-bit version of x86. That's what's in use in most processors today uh, when you run stuff like 64-bit uh, Windows and that sort of stuff, or 64-bit Linux um, on, uh, on uh, Intel machines. That's all little endian. So mostly we're all in the little endian these days. And it's great because having only one endian this makes things a lot simpler, actually. Uh, it's, it's, it's funny, we'll see kind of where that, I'll mention a little places that that comes up later. But there are big endian architectures and in the older times they were a lot more prevalent than they are today. For example, the PowerPC, uh, which I mentioned earlier today, is a big endian architecture. And so things like the Xbox 360, the PlayStation 3, before those switched, from PowerPC in their older incarnations to the Xbox One and the PlayStation 4, which are now running uh, X64 based uh, architectures. They used to be PowerPC, uh, like the cell processor, for example, is a PowerPC based processor, uh, the, P the PS3 and so on. Those were big Indian, which meant that data was the other way around in memory. So the one would have come first and the 244 would have come second. Now the reason that this is actually somewhat of concern to programmers is because if you are writing things that deal with memory directly, which oftentimes game programmers are, um, almost all games will have to deal with memory directly in a number of ways when it does like data loading uh, and stuff like this at the very least, once the data, you know, from getting the data from the disk where it's stored onto the computer. Uh, what usually turns out to be the case is the data stored on disk for a program, like let's say you're writing a game and you've got a lot of art assets. So there's textures on there and audio and all this sorts of stuff and all this kind of metadata about entities and all this stuff. If you look at all that data, it's stored on disk. You typically just have one package for your game. You've built all the, you've processed all the data and, and that sort of stuff. You may not process all that data into a different disk pack package for every platform. You may want to use the same disk package everywhere, both on the PC and on the Xbox and so on. And what that means is that data is going to be in one Endian format or another, right? It's going to either be little Endian or big Endian because it's stored on disk in a particular order. And you know whatever you wrote it out as is what it's going to stay as. So if you try to load data that is big Endian on a little Endian machine, you need to do a conversion first to swap the order of, of things around in order to make them readable, prop, you know, operable properly on the CPU. Because like I just said, the order would be different. The, the CPU will expect numbers that are bigger than eight bits to be encoded differently in each one. And where you see this uh, rear its ugly head even today when everything is like all little endian for the most part is in file formats because uh, portable file formats like let's say PSD the for the, of a Photoshop file you want to read in a Photoshop file that your artist created right and into a processing tool Photoshop I believe is big endian format because it was originally on Macs which were originally Motorola and Motorola which was sort of the earlier lineage of the PowerPC um, like the 60, 68, uh, what, the, what the hell was the name of the thing? 68,000 processor, Motorola. You know what? My memory is so bad these days. Um, someone give me a web browser. Motorola 68K, am I 68,000? This is the one I wanted, yes. The Motorola 68,000. Uh, so Macintoshes, I believe, 
uh, ran on the Motorola 68K line for a while. I don't know, I never had a Macintosh, so I don't really know. The Amiga certainly did, and I loved the Amiga, and it had 68K line in it. Those were PowerPC based, I'm sorry, those were uh, uh, Big Endian based, just like the PowerPCs that followed them. And what that means in practice is that the file formats that were developed on those systems are often Big Endian because they just wrote out the data just the way it was in memory. They didn't do any kind of different packing just because it was on disk. So what you end up with is a lot of those file formats still have their Endianness of their source architecture base baked into them. So uh, that's just a little, you know, a little aside that you should be aware of. And unfortunately, or I should say perhaps fortunately, we probably won't really run into that uh, too much on the, on the stream because since we are in a sort of uh, a good world these days where everything's the same endianness, we might only ever really run into it a little bit when we're doing something like, say, reading a Photoshop file, if that's what we want to do. But, you know, for the most part... Uh, we're sort of isolated from it because we're not probably going to have to target any processors that aren't already Little Indian. So it's, you know, it's good and it's bad. It's bad because you won't really learn it in practice, but it's, it's good in that really it's kind of just annoying and it would be better if all processors just stuck with Little Indian from now on so no one ever had to learn it again. Anyway, now that we've got that out of the way, uh, hopefully you can see uh, and understand now very directly what it means uh, to lay out things that are bigger than one byte in memory. Basically, all that happens is, you know, you go through and you start stacking up each byte that you needed for the composite value into memory. And if we were to do this again uh, with something that was even bigger, right, I could go in here and make something that's going to be 32 bits long, and maybe I make something that is quite large. For example, uh, that value there. Uh, we will see, although, you know what, let's make it so that it won't be an even power of two. Let's do that so that we'll get more bit set. Um, if we do something that's even larger, we will, as you would expect, see that it occupies more bytes. And in this case, we would expect it to occupy four bytes because we asked for a 32-bit value. Oh, there's me forgetting my 0x always. Okay. And you can see there it wrote 0, 148, 53, 199. Again, this is the low order. So there is nothing in the low order byte. Then there's the next byte, which is the next higher power, 148, next higher power, 53, next higher power, 119. Um, and that's, that's all there is to it. So that is how things are actually laid out in memory when you ask for more than 32 bits. But in, when we are actually programming for reals uh, in the mainstream, we do not want to constantly have to declare everything as little parts of little bytes and all this sorts of things because we would go crazy quickly. So what C allows us to do is it allows us to ask for things that are actually composites of many different types of things, uh, all of which might have different bit counts. So for example, let's say we were programming in the mainstream and we decided that we wanted to make, um, you know, something that you will see in a lot of games, let's say, a projectile, right? I want to make something that is going to shoot across the screen. And so maybe I have something in there that's like an int, uh, which says, you know, uh, let's say it's going to be, is this thing, you know what, let, let me not do an int quite yet. Let's do a, let's do a care unsigned that is like, is this on fire? We'll just call it that. And we'll say that, you know what, uh, this is going to be one if it's on fire and zero if it's not. This isn't probably how I would do it in the mainstream because <laughs> I'm trying to do something fairly basic for educational purposes. But let's just say that we felt like using eight bits to store something that is essentially only one bit of data. Uh, we'll get into ways of not doing that later, but let's just say we were. Uh, and then we were gonna say how much damage it does. So maybe we have a full 32 bits just because we care about it. And we're just gonna say the, the damage, uh, note, this is how much damage it does. Um, on impact, and then we have like, uh, you know, something like uh, particles per second. This is, you know, for special effects, blah, 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 blah. Uh, maybe I've got something that's like a short, which is like, you know, whatever, um, uh, you know, how many cooks there are in, in the program in case there are too many, right? Um, so let's say we have something like this. So what this thing allows us to do that I've typed in, called a struct, is it's a very simple construct in C, but it is the backbone of most of the programming that gets done in C. It is something that allows us to declare a layout of memory in a prefab way that allows us to refer to it 
uh, by its parts. So we don't have to remember how we have packed these things in memory. We can just straight up use it. So much like we said down here, we said unsigned int. If we wanted to make test be something more complicated, we could say it was a projectile. And now what it will do is instead of declaring one thing as part of test, it will actually declare all of these things for us in packed together in memory in one place that we can refer to as that one name. And we will be able to do something like this. Uh, is this on fire uh, equals one, because of course we want it to be on fire. Uh, we want the damage to be a bunch because this is a super powerful projectile, obvious, obviously. Oops, little typo there. I want particles per second. Uh, per second, you can never have too many particles, so that thing should be pretty large too, obviously. Um, tons of particles. I mean, if the engine can't handle that many particles per second, then what good is it anyway? Uh, and then there should be maybe like 50 cooks because you don't want there to be too many cooks, right? You want there to be a reasonable number of cooks. So what I have done here is I have used the C syntax for accessing a member, which is what this is called, right? These are the members or fields of this structure, right? Uh, this is how I access them. I put a period in between the name of the one that I'm talking about, the name of the particular structure that I'm talking about, and the, the, the thing inside it that I want to set, I then can use that in any place I would have used it if I just had declared it outside. So if I was just declared this itself uh, and started using it, uh, anywhere I could use it would be fine. I can use it on the other side of things too. I could, for example, make the damage be based on whether it had fire. So for example, I could make the damage be that. So it'll add one to the damage if the thing was on fire, for example, right? Um, and these are, again, this is programming, so they're order dependent. The CPU at, will do these in the order in which they appear. And what that means is that this, this on fire will be set to one before it gets used here. Now, if I had done that in the opposite order, it's obviously worth noting, this would actually have been just whatever was in memory, whatever was in the part of memory that was reserved at the time. It would be totally uninitialized, and that would be pretty much probably a bug in the code because God knows what that value would be. Uh, but since we're doing it in this order, we know that we initialized it first so we can use it safely and know that the value is going to be what we set it to, which is one. All right, so if I go ahead and run the program to this point, we can do the same thing, even though this is a structure that's a bunch of things, we can still use that little operator, the memory, uh, the, the addressing operator, ampersand, we can still use that to get where the structure is, right? 0x42fdc4 is where our structure is. And what that will do is that will give us the beginning of the structure, right? It will give us where uh, the first value, the first one's defined, this is on fire, where that is. And then we can assume that the compiler has basically you know, packed everything else sequentially. But what we will notice, and I think we'll even see this here because of the way that I've typed it out, uh, what we don't know is how much space it might leave in between them. So the compiler is not under any particular uh, constraint to lay these things out compactly. So this is eight bits, right? It's care unsigned. So in fact, I'll go ahead and do this. I'll go ahead and do this math for you here. So if we say that we have a care unsigned, then that's one byte, right? So it's one byte for the first thing. We have a 32-bit value for the damage, so that's four bytes, right? We have a 32-bit value for the particles per second, that's four bytes, and we have a short, which is uh, two more bytes, 16 bits, uh, that is how many cooks there are, right? So this is what we've got. So we would expect, adding this together, four plus four is eight, plus two is 10, plus one is 11. We would expect to see something like 11 bytes reserved for our projectile, right? Every time we want a projectile, we would expect the compiler to reserve 11 bytes. But before I go ahead here and show you this, I think I'm actually gonna do something a little bit different, which is uh, throw this, this in the mix. There is a, a compile time keyword you can use in C called size of, which will actually tell you how big something is. So we can actually do size of int equals size of int. We can do size of car equals size of car. And we can even stick something like unsigned in there. So any type that you want can go in here and it'll tell you. Uh, we can do size of int, we did that. And then we can finally do size of test, which is however big this thing would be, which will be the same as asking size of projectile. Right? Size of projectile, the type, is the same as size of test, the variable, because test 
is a projectile, right? So let's see what happens if I actually go and do these things. If I come down and do these things and I look at them in the watch window, I do size of car, size of int, size of projectile, size of test, we will see that some things are what we expected and some things aren't. So size of, of car is one, which is exactly what I said because it always returns it in bytes and we said that char was one byte, it was eight bits, right? Int, we said was 32 bits, which is four bytes, exactly what we said, four, right? And you know what, I didn't do this one, but we could totally do it. Size of short is two, which is exactly what we said. So, you know, this, this math should be right, right? It's one byte plus four bytes by four bytes, but two bytes is 11 bytes. What's wrong? What happened? What's weird here, right? And the answer is, like I sort of started saying before, is that the compiler is not under any constraint to lay this structure out in packed, as, as compactly as possible, if you will. It is not necessary. It doesn't have to do that. Uh, so what it can do is, if it thinks it would be more efficient because of the way the CPU accesses things, for example, and the instructions it has at its disposal, if it thinks it would be more efficient, for example, to reserve 32 bits for each of these, because let's say the CPU is much slower at accessing uh, an 8-bit value that is unaligned, that's like kind of at a, you know, that's, that's off of a 32-bit boundary, maybe the processor is set up to access things at, on 32 uh, bit boundaries very quickly, but 8-bit boundaries not so fast, right? So it may be like, oh, you know what? I'm, I'm actually not going to pack these things tightly. I'm going to actually reserve 32 bits for each of them because I know I can generate faster code that way. The compiler is allowed to do that. So what we actually see happening here, the size of projectile and size of test is not 11, it's actually 16. And 16 is sort of doing exactly what I said. If we look at this, we see that there are four elements and each of those elements having four bytes would be 16. So did that happen? I don't know, let's find out. If I go in here and set something that makes it much easier for us to see, I'll just put a one um, in each one of these things, right? Then what we would expect to see in our memory window, if I look at the address of test, is we should be able to see as it filled those in exactly how it decided to pack them for us. And there's another way we can actually tell that too. So we'll see, we're gonna see it in two different ways here. But so if I go ahead and step now, you'll see it wrote the one in there and you'll notice it didn't actually write anything else. So it only wrote to the first byte, but then when it wrote to the next one, you will note that it skipped. It did exactly what I suspected it would do, which is it skipped three bytes to keep things on essentially a 32-bit boundary, a four-byte boundary. Now, it wrote all of them this time. And the reason that it wrote all of them this time is because this one is declared as an int. Since this one was declared as a car unsigned, it is not uh, incumbent upon the compiler to actually do anything with these values. Essentially, they were just padding. They were there to make sure that things were aligned on particular boundaries for the CPU to be more efficient, which it turns out x86 is more efficient, I think, uh, at a number of things in this way. So it was probably smart of the compiler to do that. But point being, it does not actually have to write any values to these because we will never access them. We will only ever be reading just these uh, eight bits here. And so it was strictly doing that to maintain the alignment. Same thing with particles per second. It's gonna write the 32 bits there and uh, it's gonna write all of them as we expect. And then too many cooks does exactly what the first one did, only this one's 16 bits instead of eight bits and it leaves the other two untouched. But we know that it reserved 16 bit um, bytes because we asked the compiler how big it was and it said 16. So it's actually using all of those. Now. We can also ask a different way. We can ask where each individual memory uh, piece is by using the address operator again. Oops, is this on fire, not is this of fire. Um, I can actually ask where each individual part of this structure is in memory, and we can actually see that the number uh, of the address goes up exactly as we'd expect, right? Eight to C to zero to four. but can we really see that? No, we can't because we haven't done hexadecimal yet, which brings me to my next topic for today, which is understanding hexadecimal. Okay, now I alluded to this a bit in the stream beforehand. Okay, I alluded to this a little bit in the stream, uh, I believe, I don't know, two days ago? I'm not even sure when. We've done enough streams now that I don't remember what's on every stream. Uh, I wanna teach you just quickly how to read hexadecimal just so you'll know. Uh, and you can start to practice it because, like I said, everything is kind of written in it when you're looking at memory addresses because they get big, and so it just keeps it a little more compact. That's all. So if you look at this number, for example, up, ah, I didn't want you to do that. You don't need to do that, Mr. Compiler. There. 
Um, if you look at this number, basically this, uh, people prefer this kind of concise, more concise notation to that. Uh, I, to be honest with you, I've never been a huge Mr. You know, really excited about hexadecimal or anything like that. But the reason that it does also become kind of nice to use at some point is just because it's binary aligned, if you think of it that way. Like this number, a decimal number is not binary aligned, so you can't peel off the digits as if they were powers of two. There's nowhere I can stop in this number and say that was just the first byte, was that part, right? Um, because it's all mixed together since it's base 10 and we're, you know, the binary base two and base 10, they don't overlap correctly. Um, so basically the nice thing about hexadecimal is if I just wanna talk about what's in the bottom byte, I know that's just the first two characters and I can look at them separately. And so that's really probably where most of the use of hexadecimal comes in in practice is just that ability to kind of say what's the low byte, what's the high byte without having to try and figure it out from a decimal which makes it kind of hard to do. So the way to read hexadecimal is it just looks like this, uh, 0 through 16. And when I get to the part where I would be wrapping in base 10 to 10, I actually switch to using A through F. Uh, so basically this is the hexadecimal uh, conversion chart. Whenever you are trying to represent the numbers from zero to 15, you simply change them into the numbers zero through the letter F, and that is hexadecimal. So if I have A as a hexadecimal number, in C it is always written with a zero X prefix. That is basically just I have, you know, I have no idea how they picked 0x, but they write in a z with a 0x prefix to basically say the number that comes next will not be decimal, it will be hexadecimal. If I say 0xa, what I really mean is 10. If I say 0xaa, right, what I really mean is 10 for this first one, right, because they actually are written just like decimal, the lowest value comes at the, at the, at the far end and, and going upwards in power from there, uh, plus 16 times 10 right? Because each one of these letters goes up by 16. So this is really 160 uh, plus 10, right? Or 160, right? So if I was in here and I said OXAA, I, yes, thank you. I don't care about edit and continue. Just please show me. Damn you. Oh, sorry. Way to do math there, Casey. Yeah. Plus 10. I told you I was bad at math. I wasn't kidding. I couldn't even add 160 to 10. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, if I put OXAA in there, I get 170. And similarly, it just keeps going up by 16. So if I did OXAA, I'm talking about 16 times 16 times 10, plus 16 times 10, oops, right? Plus 10. And it's the same exact thing as base 10. If I were to tell you that I had the number, you know, 444, right? That's saying four times 100 plus four times 10 plus four. Right? And so all we're doing is the exact same damn thing in a different base. We're just multiplying by 16 every time we go out one digit instead of multiplying by 10. It's the easiest stupid thing in the world. And like I said, the only even reason that I think anyone actually cares or does it is because it's a little more concise and it lines up with binary, which is all we really wanted. And decimal doesn't line up with binary, so it tends to not be used when binary is the thing that we're mainly talking about. But for the most part, numbers in C will usually be decimal um, or there'll be what's called floating point, which is basically like a, um, you know, it's based like 1.232 or something like a, a fractional number. We'll be using mostly numbers that look like that. So actually hexadecimal will mostly be when we're talking about bit, like specific little fiddly bit things. Uh, and so you won't really have to worry about them that much. Like you don't have to be some kind of awesome, I can translate hexadecimal in my head kind of way uh, to do anything like that. Okay. So that's hexadecimal. So let's see where we're at here um, for the day. Like I said, I have notes today even. Uh, we did end endiness and we did hexadecimal. We did struct. Uh, and so the other thing that I'd like to, to look at then is, is casting. Uh, I'd like to look at, at how casting works. So what I'd like to now do is, is point out again that one of the main advantages of programming in something like C is that you are in complete control a lot of times. And, and you know, complete control is wrong because assembly language is really the only place where you get complete control. But you're in uh, pretty complete control about how things are happening with memory and how the CPU is, is doing the things that it's going to do. And so given that that's the case, 
if you look uh, at something like this projectile struct where I asked the compiler to lay this thing out for me, um, basically I can do more complex stuff than just access it in this way. Like, it's not like something like uh, a highly structured, high level programming language where once you say this, you must always use it this way and there's no way to do anything else with it. I don't have to do that at all. Uh, I can do some pretty fantastically wacky things if I should want to or if they should become interesting for me to do. And so I will show you a little bit of that now. Let's say that what I really wanted to do is look at this structure as if it were a series of shorts, right? So what I want to do is I want to use the pointer thing that I had referred to in the previous uh, stream. I want to use a pointer uh, called, let's say, Mr. Pointer Man. And I want to look at test as if it were a bunch of shorts. So I'll do the assignments first. I'll put these on there. I'll actually do the, the, the assignments, the one. And you know what? I'll make it so that we can tell which one's which just by you know, assigning a different value to each of them, let's say. Uh, and what's going to happen is I am going to ask to see, uh, I, I want to basically look at the memory occupied by test as if it was just a bunch of 16-bit values instead of looking at it in the way that it's laid out here by name. Now, in order, C is a statically typed programming language is what it's called. Uh, that's the, the type of language it is. And static typing means that C keeps track of what you said things were. If you said something was an int or you said something was a care unsigned or you said something was a projectile. It keeps track of those and it will warn you or give you an error if you try to use something in a way that you didn't tell it. So when I ask for the address of something, like if I were to ask for the address of test, for example, if I was to say projectile pointer um, you know, equals at test and I compile this, you will notice that this line compiles fine but the line that I want to show you does not compile fine, right? Uh, it gives me an error. It says initializing cannot convert from projectile star to short star. And the reason for that is because when I take the address of something, it's assumed to be the type of the thing plus the star, saying it is a pointer, it is a location in memory that says where something like this is. But down here, since test isn't a short, it's a projectile, it says, hey, wait a minute. Uh, I think you may have made a mistake. You asked me for the pointer to a projectile, I gave that to you, and now you're trying to turn that into a pointer to a short. That seems like a bug. Now, it's very good that it did that for me. Even though I love low-level programming, I love static type checking. I really like static typed uh, languages because I, they catch errors. I make mistakes all the time. You've seen me make errors in this very stream. Um, maybe not tonight. I don't know if I made errors yet. I probably have. But like in last night's stream, for example, I made a mistake. I, uh, I made two mistakes even, I think. So. I make mistakes all the time, and one of the things that you need to, to be, at, when you write a lot of code, you need to learn how to use language features to effectively catch your mistakes. And this is a great one. This catches a ton of mistakes. At compile time, you don't even have to run the program. It knows there's a problem. But, like I said, C lets you do pretty much anything you want with memory, so that error is just there to let you know you may have made a mistake. But you can easily tell the compiler, it's okay, man. Uh, I know what I'm doing. I'm a trained professional, in quotes. Uh, so I am going to go ahead and tell you it's okay to let me do the thing that I was about to try. And the way that you do that was a thing called a cast. And the way that you cast things is you basically just put in parentheses before the value. You put in parentheses uh, the type you want the thing to become. So yes, this is a projectile star. I would like it to become a short star, please and then this line will compile properly, as we can see. So now if I run to this line, right, I will be able to go into the watch window here, and I will be able to look at Mr. Pointer Man, and what you can do in the watch window, this has nothing to do with C, by the way, this is just something that the watch window supports. If you want, if you have a pointer like Mr. Pointer Man, uh, I showed you in a previous stream that you can open this little plus, and it'll show you the values that are in it, right? It'll show you what the different values actually are. Um, and so if I look at Mr. Pointer Man, oops, didn't mean to copy that, uh, it'll show me the first value, but I know, we already looked, I knew that I was estimating it would be 11 bytes. The way the compiler actually packed it, it was actually 16 bytes, right? So it was actually 16. Uh, oh, this is going to make me your compile again, isn't it? Damn you, edit and continue. I need to turn edit and continue off. It's ruining my flow. 
Uh, so anyway, when I, when I get Mr. Pointer Man, I can look at the first one, but I may want to look at more of them because 16 bytes, that's eight shorts. That's eight 16-bit values. So if I want to look at all of it, I can put comma eight after it, and then that will tell it to look at eight values. And you can see that it shows me all eight values here, right? And what's interesting about this is you can actually now see uh, sort of the, the structure thing in action, if you will. Uh, we, we, we looked at the memory before, and I will, I will bring it up again. 16FC38, right? Uh, we looked at the memory, and what we have here is we asked it to interpret as shorts, which means that even though I wrote a 1, as the this is on fire. It's only wrote eight bits of that and it just used the rest as padding. So when I ask it to interpret as a short, it's actually gonna grab the 204 and the one, right? So it's gonna actually use all of that to, to compute the actual short value. And I asked it to be signed, you know what, since we haven't really done signed yet, I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch to unsigned. Oops. Remember the cast always has to line up and you see that caught another, well, it didn't really catch an error, but you can see it, it always warns me if the types don't align. So you, when you cast something, then the thing that you put it into is going to have to be that same type. Uh, so anyway, if I go here and I, uh, I go ahead and look at that memory, 38F988, uh, if I go here, here and look, it will have grabbed these values. So it grabbed 204, and that's in the high byte. So it's 204 times 256 in the high byte plus the one, and you can see that comes out to be the value that's actually there, right? Because remember, the high byte starts at 256. So one in the high byte is 256, two is 512, and so on, right? So it goes up times 256. Um, so that's why that happened is because the garbage that was in there uh, beforehand doesn't get erased. So if we start to interpret it, we get garbage, uh, which is exactly what we expect. This is 204, 204, so it's 204 plus uh, 256 times 204. Um, Edit and continue. Why? Why must you do it? You know what? Um, I feel like there's got to be a way to turn off edit and continue. Since this is a weekend stream, you can be a little more meandering. I am going to figure out how to turn off this, this damn edit and continue. Edit and continue. No. Don't. Don't do this. How do I? Okay. No, 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 no. All right. Hold on a second. Maybe we have to stop. Um, I want to set the settings and make it never ever do that again. No, 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 no. Uh, so view, solution explorer, properties. Uh, is this in here? I don't even know. No, maybe that was in options, tools, options. Then continue, innate, no, there we go. Okay, that's what we want. It's just off. Just don't ever do that again. I don't ever want to hear from you again, ever, in the history of time. Bad edit and continue, bad. I think what that's trying to do is that's basically trying to let me edit code on the fly and then keep running which is not something I had any interest in doing in this particular uh, series. All right, so hopefully now let's find out. Um, actually, let me just test this first to see if I, uh, I can do, do, do. Ah, there we go. Okay, so it'll warn me now, which is fine. I don't mind warning. I don't need to turn that off, but I just wanted it to stop uh, hassling me and re making me restart the program, especially since uh, we're in the mode where it has to rebase all the time. It's doing the, the security-based rebasing, so I have to type the, the address in every time in the, in, the, in the thing. All right, so back to our regularly scheduled program. Uh, if we look in here, uh, we can see the, the various values uh, as they are getting written out, and uh, they are exactly where we expected them to be. Everything is copacetic. We see that the values are what we expect. Like I was saying, it's 204 plus 256 times 204 on the next one, which is exactly what we expected to see. The next one... Uh, because it was written out as an actual, um, let's see, for a FB40, there we go. Because it was written out as a 32-bit value, uh, what that'll do is it's going to use this uh, to, as the next short, which is 2, 0, which is just 2 again, and then 2 zeros, which is 0, right? 3, 0, which is 3, and 0, 0, which is 0. Then the 4 was written out as a short, so we see it as a short properly, but then there's still two extra bytes of padding, and we see that number again, which is 204 to 204. Now, one thing you may be wondering, and I alluded to this in a previous stream, but I'll explain it now, is why is everything 204? Why is it 204? If this is just garbage memory that we haven't initialized yet and haven't written anything to, why is it always 204? The answer is because 204 in hexadecimal 
is CC. See that? So OX CC 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 is basically 204, 204, 204, 204. And what happens when you compile in debug mode in, in uh, using Visual Studio's compiler is that you can turn on a thing and it's turned on by default. So when I added this, when I made this new project, it's turned on the default in debug builds. There's a thing that basically says clear all values to 0x c c c c c c c c c c c c and c's all the way to the end. Write c c's in there, 204s the whole time, because a lot of errors come from uninitialized values. Like a lot of errors in code come from you doing something like the thing I alluded to before, like saying this when I never initialized this, you know, test this is on fire, right? So if things were uninitialized, they might default to zero. They might default to some value that might work. They might default to some value that you might not notice. But 0xcc is very blatant. It doesn't come up that often by accident. And so what the compiler does to try to help you in debug builds is it just clears the values to oxccc so that when you're stepping through your code and you get to something like this, and you look and you go, oh, this, this wasn't working right, what's going on? And I look at this is on fire, I see OXCC and I'm like, oh, it's an uninitialized variable, right? Whereas if it hadn't done that, maybe it might've been zero because that's what was in there before. Zero is a common value to appear in memory. And memory, I think on Windows is even zeroed before you get it normally because of security concerns. It has to erase the memory mm. in case you were to get physical memory that was occupied by like a password or something that would be a security leak. So it might well be zero, which would make you think your code was working right up to the point where you accidentally happen to get some memory that was recycled from something else in your same process and it's not set to zero and now all your code is ruined. Uh, and you don't know why and you've got a really hard to find bug because it doesn't happen all the time. It only happens when that page gets recycled and blah, 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 very hard bugs to find. So the reason that everything is OXCC is because this is a debug build. If this were a release build with that feature turned off, uh, we would be trying to be more optimal. The compiler would not spend its time clearing values to CC uh, because that would be inefficient and you don't want to do that in a release build that's supposed to be performance oriented. So there you go. Okay, so that is casting. We've covered endianness, we've covered casting, we've covered structs, we've covered hexadecimal. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to cover today uh, is I wanted to cover the, um, <clears throat> the, some bitwise operators and some other things about accessing structures. So we're gonna go for maybe about 10 more minutes uh, and get those things out before the Q&A. So, you may be wondering, uh, I know that you are. Uh, oh, and by the way, just, I mean, I'm sure this is kind of starting to be obvious by now. Oh, you know what? Instead of me having to say it as an aside, I'll just do it as an actual thing because it can lead right in. So there's another thing you can do in C. It is called array indexing. And basically, uh, in a lot of other languages, when you hear the term array, what that means is it means a collection of objects that are indexed by a value that is a, a number. So for example, I may have a bunch of projectiles. Um, and so in other languages, you may see something like uh, this, where I type in, I want a bunch of projectiles. I want 40 projectiles, right? And this little bracket syntax here means that I want you to make 40 of these. So instead of me having to do something ridiculous like this, right? Blah, 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 blah. Here's all my projectiles. One, two, three, right? Blah, 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 all the 40. I don't have to do that. I can just say, give me 40 of them. I know I need 40, just, just do it. And furthermore, when it does it, instead of it being uh, fine for the compiler to put them anywhere that it wants to, well, I want them to be laid out uh, at regular intervals in memory so that I can access them by an integer, so that I can say projectiles four and get the fourth one uh, predictably. Right? It doesn't have to be me like guessing where exactly they are. So if I had some, if I actually had this, the kind of crazy thing I was talking about before where I have projectile um, zero, let's say, and I have projectile one, let's say I have an integer called which projectile that's gonna be set to be either zero or one, right? And I want to be able to use that integer um, to be, oh, I'm still doing it. You know what, I'm just gonna cover this right now. I've done it too many times. You can stick the equals right after the declaration. Instead of having to do this, um, so I've done it so many times, I just need to get it out of the way. I should have done it the very first stream. Uh, so instead of doing this, where I just declare something and then give it a value, you can, you can always just do it on the same line. It's fine. 
right? So that's all I was doing. So if I have a value here and I want to use that value to pick one of these projectiles, there's no easy way to do it. Uh, I would have to use something that we're going to cover in the next stream where I do something like, oh, which projectile, uh, if it's equal to one, then do the thing, you know, here, do, do something to projectile one, um, else do it to projectile uh, two, you know, uh, zero or something like this. So you would end up in, in some kind of bad situation where you're doing something like this. And again, I'll, I'll cover what these what if statements stuff are in the next stream. So I don't want to go into it, but I'd have to do something where I'd actually write what's called control flow code to actually get at the projectile that I want. And so what I'd rather do is lay them out in memory so that I can just use arithmetic to access the one that I want. And that is what happens when you use this syntax. It lays them out consecutively in memory spaced by a known number, a known size, usually the size of the structure itself. And then I can use this bracket to just access one of them, and I can even access them uh, by a, a variable. So if I have, you know, which projectiles for, I can do that, right? Now, in other languages, this is actually an abstract construct. There's nothing you can do with it in a lot of other languages. You're just like, you got 40 of them, you can access them with this syntax. That's all you know. In C, that is not the case. In C, uh, this actually creates just, it's just about memory layout. All it means is do that memory layout that I just said, which means that you can actually go ahead and do something like take that projectile pointer that we had before, get rid of this, um, take that projectile pointer and make the projectile pointer be equal to the start of the array, right? Now, you'll notice that normally what you may have expected me to have to do is put the address there because I said when we want to take the address of something, I need to put the address operator. But in C, one of the weird things they decided to do uh, is make it so that this actually is just a pointer. Arrays aren't really all that different from uh, just having a pointer to the beginning. So instead of bothering to make you write this syntax, which honestly it may have been better if they had done because there's some reasons why it's a little bit wonky. There's some things that, there are a few things that C does wonky and this is one of them. There's reasons why it's a little wonky but I won't belabor them now because I don't think they're really relevant. But point being, this may have been a better decision depending on how you wanted to look at it. Basically what happens when you do this is you just end up with a pointer to the first one. That's what you basically have. So if you want to get a pointer to where they are, you end up with this. So if I actually go ahead here, compile this. Um, oh, hey, look at this. So you know I was talking about that 0xcc thing? This is kind of nice. It gave me a warning that uh, test was uninitialized when I used it, that this, this on fire thing was uninitialized. So that's kind of, doesn't have anything to what we're doing now, but it's just, it's good to know, right, that the compiler will catch some of those for you. That's, that's awesome. So that was the 0xcc thing as well. Uh, it's, it's basically got, multiple ways to help you not make that mistake. It's got the 0xc to prevent it, and it's also got, if it can tell, if the compiler can look at the code and just obviously tell, um, oftentimes it can't because the code's too complicated and it doesn't know where you're getting stuff from, but in the case where it can tell, it can give you a warning, which is awesome, yeah. So those are good. Uh, wow, I'm gonna type that. How many times are we gonna take this is of fire? There we go. All right, so if I go ahead and jump down here and I take a look at what I get, um, with my projectiles. Now you can see, first of all, in the watch window, I can ask for just projectiles, which is the whole array. And if I expand it, you can see I've got all the ones I asked for, right? I've got all the projectiles are in here and I can look at each individual one, right? And it's made that structure for me. And of course, they're completely uninitialized crap at this point, right? There's nothing, you know, I, I haven't written in any of those. So they're all OXCCCCCCCC in debug mode, like I said, and which you can see they all have the same values and it's all garbage, it's all zero, it's all 24, 204 is the whole way. Um, so, because I haven't done anything in release mode, they would have just been whatever, who knows, whatever happened to be in that place in memory at the time when it reserved it. Uh, so that's what I've got. And when I look at the address of this, 0x0025, right? I can go in here if I want to again, and uh, just like everything else, I can look at it and see, of course it's a giant block of, of 204s that it just initialized to. Uh, when I look at projectile pointer, Right, projectile, ooh, oh, no, ah, okay. When I look at projectile pointer, uh, you can see that it's the same value. So projectiles and projectile pointer are essentially the same. Now the reason that I say that they're essentially the same and not exactly the same is because of this little problem right here. And this is why I say C is a little wonky, something that's good to be aware of. If I were to ask how big this is, well, how big do we expect this to be, right? How big do we expect an array of 40 projectiles to be? Well, we know that the compiler decided to reserve 16 bytes per projectile. So we might expect this to be 16 
times 40, right? That's what we would probably expect that to be. So if I said size of projectiles, you know, how big is it, right? Um, or you know what, let me name this a little better. Size of projectiles, right? I would expect it to, to, to see that, right? But if I ask for size of projectile pointer, right? What is the size of projectile pointer? Well, I would expect to see something else. Now, because I know what it is, I expect to see four because I believe pointer is to be four bytes on the thing that I'm compiling to, and this is a pointer, right? So I'm gonna actually double check, those are both case. So we look on here and we say size of projectiles and size of projectile, oops, projectile pointer. Yep, that's exactly what we thought. 16 times 40 is in fact 640. Everyone's happy, exactly what we thought. But I will point out that is the little bit of the snafu. So I can set this equal to this thing, right? I can say that projectile pointer equals projectiles, which means that C is, and, and it didn't give me a warning or an error or anything. C is agreeing with me that projectiles is just a pointer to uh, the first one. And, and that, you know, that totally worked and we saw it work. We know that's what it does. But even though that's the case, C secretly understands during the, you know, in a place where it can see this definition, it secretly understands actually how big it is, such that when I ask, even though it knows it's functionally a pointer, and I can treat it as a pointer, I can, I can do that with it, it's not really treating it as a pointer because it actually does remember that it's this bigger thing. And so that's why I say it's a little wonky because really these aren't exactly the same type. And so this probably should just fail. It probably should have thought of it a little differently, but you know, C is a great language. I'm not here to second guess their design decisions. Maybe there's good reasons for it, I don't know. Um, but point being, it does seem like that's one of the places where C is maybe not quite as watertight as one would have hoped. So there you go. Uh, all right, so that's what's called array syntax. And this is a array uh, accessor, which allows you to pull out uh, individual things. And what I wanted to demonstrate for you was that array syntax is really, it's complete shorthand. It's all it is, is just shorthand for messing with memory. So if I wanted to, for example, uh, talk about the 30th projectile, right? I'm gonna talk about the 30th projectile. I'm gonna set the 30th projectile damage to 60. That's what I'm gonna do. What this actually translates into, okay, is nothing more than the pointer to the base of it, right? The pointer to the base of it, plus 30 times the size of a projectile, one projectile, right? Dot damage. Actually, I think, well, I'm gonna have to talk about what this guy is right here in a second. But if I wanted to, I could use this exact same syntax to access the 30th one. And I'll talk about what this guy is here in a minute. It's another weird C-ism, uh, but this is basically the same as this dot operator up here, but I'll talk about why I couldn't use the dot in a second. So if I wanted to do that, uh, oh, hello. What is the problem? Uh, compile, compile, there we go. Projectile, undeclared, oops, projectiles. There we go. Spelling errors, always good, okay. So if I wanna look at this, I'm gonna look at the projectile, I'm gonna look at projectile 30, like I said, and I'm gonna expect it to be set to 60. And hey, look, it's set to 60. In fact, you know what, let's, let's just double check. We'll make sure that it's all going right. Um, stop, stop, everyone stop. No, don't do it. Um, yes, there we go, okay. Oh, one other thing I need, sorry. It's bringing up more things than I, more things than I was hoping for. Uh, hmm. All right. This is my first te bad teaching mistake that I've made. All right. Well, we're gonna have to take this in two steps. I just realized that the thing that I wanted to do, you can't quite show directly. So, all right, we got to show this. I'll show this first and then I'll show this. It's just, it's just crazy how much syntax I have to do to show the thing that I wanted to do. Um, so, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, it's, it's a little more, it's a little more, uh, uh, involved, I guess I would say, uh, than, than, than what I had hoped for. Okay, let's do that again. All right, so back to where we are, uh, and I will promise I'll explain all of that in a second. I'm not trying to hand wave on you. It's just I realized that the thing I was trying to do wouldn't actually work the way that I wanted to show you how I would do it because it involves more casting. So we're gonna have to get to that in a second. So we see that damage is set to 60 on the 30th projectile, which is exactly what I was trying to do. 
Now what I wanted to show you as well is that I can also do is do point arithmetic, but the thing is, C tries to be helpful. Uh, and I kind of didn't think about this when I was going to type it in, but you know, when I'm actually coding, it's, it's second nature. You would know this. It's just that I was trying to think teaching wise. So I got a little ahead of myself. But what C does when it does pointer arithmetic like this, when I look at, when I, when I take a pointer to some place in memory and I add something to it, it actually uses the type that you have told it that it was, which was projectile. Remember, projectile pointer is a projectile. It uses the type that it told you it was, and it actually automatically does the multiplication for you. So I wanted to show you how to do this multiplication, but actually C will do this multiplication. It's going to automatically multiply by the size of the projectile when I add 30. So this here is actually this. C just inserts that multiplication for you. So it knows I'm trying to go by projectiles, and it adds 30 times that. So when I look at this, what I'm actually looking at is 30 times 16 down from the start of projectile pointer, and then I set the damage equal to 100. So now if we execute this line, right, you will see that it did exactly what I said it would do. It sets it to 100. So I can actually do the pointer arithmetic myself, right? But what I wanted to show you was to do it entirely manually. And in order to do that, what I have to do is first force C using a cast, just like I said before, to treat this pointer as if it was pointing to only 8 bits, which is care, right? Then I can do the add in individual bytes. Then I can cast it back to a projectile to access the damage member of it, which will set it to 100. Does that make sense? And that will do exactly that. Of course, we already had it set to 100, so it's just going to set it to 100 again. I probably should have made that different value. So let's take that a little bit more slowly, since I had to sort of whip out a bunch of stuff that I kind of didn't want to have to whip out just at that point. But you know, what are you going to do? Programming is complicated sometimes, you got to roll with it. So uh, yes, this is actually a little more straightforward. Hopefully this is understandable. Uh, the reason that I enclosed this in parentheses is because parentheses, much like they do in math, help to group things together so the compiler knows what order to do things. You can imagine that if I had written this, right, it would be very confusing for the compiler because it looks like I'm trying to access the damage member of 30, which doesn't make any sense. So the parentheses just allow it to know, OK, I'm trying to add 30 to projectile pointer, which gives me a new projectile pointer that happens to be 30 projectiles down from where it started. And then I'm going to you know, make that damage equal to 100. Makes, makes reasonable sense. Now, what this catastrophic line is, right, is this is actually doing a series of operations. First, it is making a byte pointer that just points to bytes. And it's making a byte pointer by doing this operation, right? Remember I said casting turns something into a type that it wasn't before. It just says, hey, C, trust me. And remember, really, this is to get rid of the error. It's not really changing what the code does in any particular way. It's just to get rid of the error that I would get, right? You see how I get an error there? Because this is a pointer to a projectile, and I wanted a projectile to a care. I can't just do that without telling C, hey, relax. It's cool. I know what I'm doing. I'm a professional programmer, so I'm going to do the cast, and it's good. So there we go. That's fine. I'm creating a byte pointer. Now I want to move the byte pointer forwards right, by the right amount. So that is 30 times the size of the projectile. Right? That will get me to where I want to be. But you know, And I can certainly compile this code, and you can see that it all works. But I can't now do byte pointer arrow damage equals 200, right? If I were to try and, try and do that, I'd get an error. And the reason I get an error is because this is a point to a car, and a car is just 8 bits totally anonymous. There is no such thing as damage of those, right? And so what, what I have to do before I can do that is I have to turn that pointer back into a projectile pointer, right? I have to do projectile pointer 30, um, right? And then I can cast back, just like I was doing before, by pointer like this. And now I can use that. That pointer will work, right? And you can see that works fine. So that is the crazy shenanigans you have to do to do the pointer because C is trying to help you out. It's trying to help you not have to remember or not have to know uh, at that particular point in the code what you would need to add to it in order to get you 30 things down. It wants you to be able to just use the 30 directly, which is kind of helpful most of the time. It is what you want. But for purposes of this demonstration where I wanted to show you how the memory is something that's directly controllable by you and you can actually go in at the byte level and poke everything, I just wanted to show you that you can move these things around and do the array access yourself. So this line is nothing other than this magic sequence right here or this sequence right here. Now you can see what I did. This is just exactly the previous thing, right? Just in more concise, in a, it all wrapped up in one line. First, I casted it to a Kerastar, right? That right there is this, 
right? Then I added 30 times the size of it, that's this, right? Then I casted it back to a projectile, that's this. Then I accessed the damage member, that's this. So I just wrapped all that up into one line, and you can always do that in C. You can wrap crazy amounts of stuff into one uh, little expression if you want to. So the final thing uh, that I wanted to uh, talk about, I guess, because uh, the stream is about up now. Um, I don't know if I want to, I think I'm going to save the other thing I was going to talk about till next time, uh, is this arrow, right? Because I kind of waved it. I was like, oh, the arrow has to be instead of the dot, whatever. What does that actually mean? Well, in C, there's a difference between a pointer and an actual thing. So if I say projectile test, like I did up above, right? Um, this thing right here, right? If I say projectile test, then accessing it looks like this. That's how I access it, test dot the thing. But if I say projectile star test, so I have a pointer to a test, right? And I'm actually talking about the pointer itself, I have to use the, the arrow syntax. There is no difference between these two things other than that. That is the only difference. It is strictly whether the thing you have is declared to be a pointer or whether you were talking about the actual thing on the actual stack. That is the only difference. There really is absolutely no reason for this distinction. And it's another one of the places that I think C is a little wonky. Really, probably what should have happened is this should have just been considered a pointer and it should always have just been dot to access everything or something like that. But again, not a language designer. I don't really want to second, second guess the C++ people, I'm mean the C uh, designers. So I'm not going to say that it was necessarily good or bad. I'm just going to say it does seem to be a little bit wonky because they don't really do anything different. And there's almost even no way to make a bug out of it. Like it's not like it can catch a bug. If I had that as a dot, it, it really, it, it doesn't even help that it's gonna tell me it's wrong, right? Like the fact that it tells me it's wrong, it, there's almost nothing else I could have meant there other than, other than arrow. So it's, yeah, it's, it's really kind of weird that it's even a thing. It's, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. So anyway, that's the only other thing I wanted to, care, uh, to, to mention is that the arrow syntax and the dot syntax, you have to know whether you were dealing with a pointer or whether you're dealing with actually a thing on the stack uh, in order to, to know which one of them to use. But fortunately, the compiler always tells you and the answer is always just to switch it. Uh, so if you were the person who typed this, you would instantly get a compiler error. The compiler error would tell you exactly where it was. It would say, uh, must have a class struct union, type is projectile. Did you intend to use arrow? It even gives you the recommendation and the answer is yes. I did intend to use arrow. So I think that is everything that I wanted to cover today. It's basically how to do memory layout using uh, structs, which we did, and it was sort of showed you some of the things. There is one thing I did not mention, um, which I will mention very quickly. I don't think it's maybe something you really need to know, but there is a thing uh, uh, called a pragma, which we didn't cover, uh, oops, that you can use also something called an attribute you can use depending on the compiler. You can use extra like things that are outside of the scope of, uh, of the language necessarily and certainly are outside the scope of the original C that you can put that will allow you to wrap projectile or any struct in a way that tells the compiler that they have to be packed. So remember when I said, okay, we expected 11 bytes, we got 16. If you really care and you know that you need it to be so, there are ways to turn off that padding. It's saying, hey, look, I know there might be a performance penalty. I realize, you know, I'm putting you out here, Mr. Compiler but please, I really need you to pack these things tightly and it will do it. So there are ways, I'm not gonna cover them right now, but there are ways of telling it to pack something tightly when you need it packed tightly. It's just most of the time you don't need things packed tightly. So you'd rather have it uh, optimize them for however, whatever platform you're compiling to lay them out in the most sensible way for performance. And I think that is basically everything. Um, I'm not gonna cover bitwise operators. I'm gonna do them next uh, stream tomorrow. So hopefully, uh, I'm really glad that I think there's a fair number of people. There's, there's, oh, there's over 200 people on the stream. That's awesome for sort of an impromptu Saturday stream. So thank you so much, everyone, for showing up. It has been a, another delightful coding session with all of you. And I am going to stop the recording now. And uh, I will restart it in a second for Q&A, which will go for probably about 30 minutes. So thanks so much for joining me. And I will see you tomorrow if you would like to finish up our Intro to C series before we move on to the full Handmade Hero stream on Monday.